stoked that you are here. Happy to be here. Did you have a good weekend? Since yeah, it was nice. Time? Um, well, right off the get-go, man, the one film for me, because my dad scared the hell out of me when I was a kid with the first one, was Halloween. Halloween 3, your portrayal is something that is just always sticks out to me because it's the only one that doesn't have Michael Myers in it, obviously. But that is just, so many scenes in that film are just so incredible and creepy. The mass and everything, what was it like working on that film? Uh, it was a uh, swell old jello. We had a good time and uh, it was nice working with Stacy Nuckin. They called me over there when they were putting it together and they said, we have it down to about three girls that we're trying to choose from. Would you come over and read with them? And I said, yeah, sure. So I did and uh, Stacy came in second, I think, in uh, air as soon as she left the room, everybody said, well, I said, well, it would be discourteous to not bring in the third person anyway, so yeah. they did, but we, they hired Stacy right away, and she was a lot of fun to work with, and I never, it never occurred to me, it, it was a job, it was called Halloween 3, but it was a movie, and I liked the part, and I played it as best I could, and uh, all the other Halloween shit didn't mean anything to me. I, I didn't care that Michael Myers wasn't in it. It didn't, you know, fans didn't like it. And a lot of people didn't like it, but... Well, I bet the difference, I think everyone here liked it. Didn't matter it. at all to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the iconic song that still is played on... Uh, of social media outlets every uh, every October. Boy, were we sick of that. Because <laughs> it played in every scene we were in. Yeah. In a bar, on TV, while we're in a bar, and all over the place. It was just, you know, <laughs> three more days to Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Three more days till Halloween, Silver Shamrock. <laughs> Come on down, folks. Buy your masks. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was Tommy Lee Wallace did all the, the, the ads for uh, Silver Shamrock. The director, writer of the movie. Well, I'm not positive he wrote it, he directed it. What about, uh, for you going into that, what about that concept where, you know, there's no actual serial killer. It's this madman with killer robots who has this plan to put these masks on all the kids. And when they see, yeah. you know, the commercial, their heads are going to melt and cockroaches and snakes are going to come out. Yeah. Like, what, like, what about that, other than the obvious, because that's actually a pretty cool concept, like, when you heard that, like, what cool was concept? That's a good horror film. Jeez, crackers. <laughs> yeah, well, it was scary. And um, uh, my my first wife at that time, actual real wife, was Marge, who died in the motel room next door to me and Stacy Nelkin. Uh, having her brains eaten out by yeah. the, the thingies. Yeah, I, it was, uh, he was not a very nice fellow, Dan O'Hurley, you no. know, to invent no. all that shit, and out of old uh, Celtic magic crap and stones <laughs> and stuff, but, yeah, I thought it was uh, nasty, and I, but I think I saved the kids at the end. Yeah, no, I would they say. they turned off that final channel. Uh -huh. I have no doubt. <laughs> yeah, as we uh, as we fade out to your screams of yeah displeasure, but yeah, stop no, it, you, stop it, turn stop it off. Stop. Yeah, <laughs> I think without a doubt, you you know, Dr. Chalice saves the day. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. Did you get to keep one of the masks? Not, no. Uh uh. The only time I ever saw a mask was when they put it on me in that. <laughs> 
chair. And then I somehow magically whipped it off and whipped it over a camera, yeah. 30 feet up on a wall. It's a hell of a toss. You know that didn't happen. <laughs> Tommy Lee Wallace, I did, I did flip it twice just for that, for the move. And then he climbed a big high ladder and, and just went like that and threw it on the camera. I mean, look good, though. Yeah, yeah, I mean. That's what that's what heroes are made out of. Toss it like that. Oh sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I gotta say, over the uh, over your career on the two most iconic horror films that I watched in my childhood, Halloween three and The Fog, uh, you Tom are quite the ladies' man. Because you go from <laughs> yes, I am. You, <laughs> yes, I am. I mean, from telling your ex that you're not going to be able to take the, ch the children today to into the motel room and then <laughs> picking up uh, Jamie Lee on the side of well, the Well, you know, when you, when you <laughs> stop and think about it, what the hell kind of a doctor was Dr. Chalice? Right? <laughs> he, he runs off from his wife and two small children, takes off with the, um, uh, <laughs> a young lady uh, to what? Look, try and save her father or something. Yeah, yeah. He didn't know her. He didn't know him. It, it was a shrouded in mystery. not a very deep mystery, but <laughs> mystery nonetheless. But yeah, I got I got lucky in a couple of films, but they were movies, you know. Yeah. Not real life. But I loved uh, picking Jamie up in the truck. And uh, the first thing she says to me when she gets in in the fog is, uh, are you weird? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. Yes, I am weird. And then I take a beer from between my legs and <laughs> offer her a sip, and then it cuts to us in the bed. Doing the two? Yeah. Well, I mean, there were a couple of broken windows and other weird things happened in the truck before we got to the bed. But, yeah. <laughs> Still into that Only thing. in movies, man. <laughs> I think it was a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> the fog, I mean, that is uh, is pretty cool because it takes place right here in Northern California. Oh, yeah. It was so beautiful. We had a wonderful time doing that. So I was telling somebody yesterday, we, we were in Bodega Bay and um, Point Reyes Light and Petaluma and Inverness, all around there, just gorgeous, gorgeous part of the country, and um, and we were all staying in these A-frame little cabins in the middle of nowhere. I think they were part of a motel or something. I'm not sure, but they would put a little stack of firewood outside our door every night before we go into the thing, and uh, you could build yourself a fire. And it was so cozy and cold and shivery and it's just great, just great. And Point Reyes Lake was, is one of the most stunningly beautiful sights. And, uh, with the light halfway down the cliff, you have to yeah. go a long way down and then up into the light. And um, the light isn't at the top of the cliff like you would think. It's kind of in the middle. And you could see the, the gray whales or whatever whales they were migrating down at the at the bottom, uh, where the cliff met the ocean, right there, and it was one of those drop-ins, as I recall. You, uh, I don't recall a beach. I, I don't really see the, the the cliff face going into the uh, ocean. That's really cool. it was gorgeous, really beautiful. What was the atmosphere like that on that set? Because that's a uh, that's a movie where, for the longest time, it preys upon the fear of the unknown. You just have this fog approaching, and yeah. then eventually you get, you know, your snippets of the crew coming out of it. But yeah, as an actor, does that create more of a challenge, or was it? No, just it just creates lots of giggles. <laughs> trying to get uh, 
this was before CGI and all that stuff. So yeah. Tommy Lee Wallace and his band of merry men were down the end of this street in this little town with um, two little fog machines and a couple of fans yeah. trying to create this eerie and threatening fog. And, and, and as soon as the breeze would kick just a little, it all went away. We Hours and hours we were there while he tried to make it look uh, threatening. It was... Uh, no, I, I never even think about the acting part of it. The acting's free, but the, the fun of it is <laughs> watching people try to do what they do to make things scary and work. I thought the opening of The Fog was wonderful with uh, John Houseman telling that story to the kids around the campfire on the beach and then the, uh, the camera goes up into the night sky and then comes down over Bodega Bay and it was real. That was scary to me. I thought, wow, I love that. But he was worried that it was kind of an old-fashioned ghost story and that it wasn't going to be scary enough. So he added things after that, in the, in the, immediately after that, in the, in the village, the uh, gas pump coming out of the thing, shit falling off, store shelves, and the little stings and uh, fears that to help goose it. Yeah. The, uh, the crew themselves... And I mean this in the most uh, meaningful, respectful way. They, growing up in the '80s and stuff, they almost resemble like something that, like a character from Scooby Doo brought to real life. What did they look like in person? I'm not sure I ever even saw one. Really? Yeah. I. I don't think I ever did. The only, the only place I could have would have been in the church. Yeah. At, at the end. Right. But I'm not sure that we did that with us. Huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that they came out of the whatever they came out of into Hal Holbrook's reality and killed him dead. Right. But I don't think uh, any of us actually actually saw that. Huh. Yeah. Maybe 80 did later in, up in the in the tower, tower when she was doing what she was doing. But even, I know um, me and Jamie grabbing the kid and getting him out of the cabin, her son, who Ty, who was uh, uh, stuck in the cabin, we got him out and she tries to get away in the truck and they're closing in, but they weren't actually closing in. Right. You know, we we had to play all that imagined fear and terror and her inability to drive a goddamn truck <laughs> and get it out of there out of danger. It was a terrible truck to drive. It was a really genuinely old, beat up uh, pickup. Yeah, Ford pickup, I think it was. It was this. She had a hard time with it. Everybody did. So did I. We all did. Trying to drive it. What was the experience like working with John Carpenter? Carpenter? Yeah. John was well. He was okay. You know, he's a, he was all right. He's a good director. Knows what he wants. Writes his stuff and and uh, gets his actors to do do the job. <clears throat> when we first started talking about you know Halloween and the disbelievability of you know Dr. Chalice's throw, the dispo that is more believable than uh, the concept of Night of the Creeps, which is an outstanding another horror film from <laughs> what, yeah. how was that experience? The first I gotta tell you, the first scene that you're in in that film, uh, when you're on that on the beach and you're just kicking back, the uh, when we fast forward to adult, after the fact that you've seen, uh, when you're flashing back on the, the murder scene of the creep just bashing oh, yeah. the head in, 
I, uh, that, I don't recall that being. That's not the first scene in the film. No, no, no. Okay. No. Yeah, but that. But I love that beach scene. It's a. I have a photo of that on my desk, and I mean over here, and it's a uh, a dream sequence. Yeah, I I like that. And the, you know, in a white. I'm going to the prom. Yeah. In my, <laughs> in my mind, and I watch my girlfriend come up out of the water perfectly dry and quaffed and beautiful. Yeah, in a prom dress. But in reality she's dead and hacked to death by the thing the, you know creep a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it bizarre concept I guess, but uh, we had more fun doing that than anything. It was just a a, a giggle from beginning to end. <coughs> I don't take any of this stuff too seriously, you know. So, it's jobs, and I think uh, audiences get a lot of kick out of them, and a certain appreciation, but it's not rocket science or anything, you know, it's just making movies, make a believe. Yeah. How how many people do you know that, you know, get to spend their whole life pretending, uh, playing cowboys and Indians like they did when they were little? Yeah. Which is basically what we're doing when we're uh, ancient. Yeah. Which I am now. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side of the, the coin, not a, a straight up horror film, being at a horror convention, but another one that really stood out to me was Lethal Weapon. What? Yeah, yeah, that was, a, that was a good movie. I, I got a kick out of that. I'll tell you a little story. We're doing uh, Night of the Creeps, and which is my personal all-time fate. I, I had more fun doing that than anything. And I always look for the fun in the job. I'm, I don't care about the... I can't do anything about the script once somebody else wrote it. That's, I can only do what I do. And, but we're driving... I, I'm driving this old Merc, I think it was, an old Merc with skirts and black and all. Oh, around the back streets and alleys in North Hollywood and, and we're base camp in, in this uh, alley we're on, on, on an open area and got the caterers there, you know, a little bit of ghee dunk stuff to eat and stuff. And there's there's this guy, little guy, always wore black, smoked one cigarette after another, sitting at a table mm -hmm. that night, all night, from the beginning from when, when it first got dark, we started shooting, and it was a night shoot. So finally, halfway through the night, Freddie Decker come over and he said, Tom, Tom, God, you got to meet this guy. He's my best friend, and I he, he would love to meet him. So I go over, and it's Shane Black. Okay. Turns out that it's Shane Black. And he said, I got this movie over at Warner Brothers, and they say they're going to do it. It's called Lead the Weapon. I don't know what they're really going to do, but if they do do it, I'd love for you to be in it. I would love for you to play the crazy uh, cop, but I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to offer it to a guy named Mel Gibson. And, uh, but there's other stuff you could do in there. So I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. So I went over and I met with... Uh, I'm blank now on the director. Richard Donner? Donner, yeah, Richard Donner. And he, uh, and uh, so, and we talked, I didn't read for him, we talked about Hunsacker, and, um, and he gave me the role. So, I only have two scenes in Lethal Weapon, but I swear to God, everybody in the country saw it eight times. <laughs> I got more work out of uh, Lethal Weapon than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a really good gig for me. <laughs> good job. And a good movie. The first one. I don't know about all the rest because I died <laughs> in the first. <laughs> Is there a you know, fun story working with Mel and that crew? No, he was a, Mel was on the edge of the uh, my two scenes. So uh, and that's the way it is with movies. You, you, you know, people say, "Oh, wow, what was it like working with Mel?" I never worked with Mel. I, 
he was on the edge of two scenes. He was on the edge of the bank when Danny and I were, you know, I wanted him to kill everybody because they killed my daughter. And he was on the edge of the scene out in the yard when uh, Gary Busey killed me yeah. through my eggnog and <laughs> shot me dead. So I don't know what it's like to work with him because I didn't really work with him. But he was a swell fellow at the time, very pleasant, smoked a lot, and kept a little, um, what do you call him, a trampoline that, that bounced up and down on top of, outside of his dressing wagon, uh, honey wagon. Um, and he would just he'd jump up and down for hours smoking. <laughs> for as long as he wasn't required, you know, to be on set. And, uh, but he was real, he was pleasant, so was Danny. I got, I worked with Danny again later in a thing called Dead Man Out up in um, Montreal. We shot a uh, movie up there, it was good. Here, and here's a, another thing about working with people in movies. Adrian Barbeau and I have been in four films together and we've never been on screen together in any of them. Not one, not one iota. <laughs> Have you, did you ever get to you know, cross paths with her? When oh, you, yeah, we're good old pals. What okay. do you mean? In no, the movies? Like, yeah, no, like on set, when you say that, you've never appeared on screen with her. Like, well, um, no, it's like creep show. I, I never saw her because I was in the beginning and the end, and she didn't have anything to do with that. I, though I did see her because it shot in Pittsburgh. I lived in Pittsburgh. She came to Pittsburgh, and we were friends, so... We uh, we got together, but not on set. I did not see her on set for that. And for the fog, we saw each other all the time. And um, you know, having dinner or right. drinks or something right. after work, uh, but not on set. And same with two evil eyes. We did pass on set. I was in makeup and she was out of makeup, so going out of, and is that it? Oh, Escape from New York? Never passed. No. <laughs> oh, because me and Lee Van Cleef ran the prison, supposedly in Manhattan, but it was in Sepulveda Dam uh, in California, in, in the valley. And uh, also in New York, the Statue of Liberty for the opener. And, but they all went to the bowels of a depressed East St. Louis uh, where they shot the prison in mm -hmm. Manhattan. And so, yeah, we, so Lee Van Cleef and Chucky Cyphers and I were the only three that saw it, and Snake, Yeah, we did get to put the thing on him, and uh, and saw him at the dam after with uh, the president, <laughs> oh, what an odd guy he is, <laughs> was, rest his soul, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's funny though, don't you think, I always think, wow, we've been in four movies together, but we never worked together in the movies, the odds are that you, Any of them. That you would, yeah, yeah, but not a, not a one. Now I think it's going to be a fun challenge to never do that, you know? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. What was it? Because your, your, your career is so exten extensive and expansive of the kind of different stuff that you've done. It's only because I'm old. <laughs> I'm old. I've been doing this for 50 years. That's an accomplishment. Thank you. Started with a detective in 1967, Frank Sinatra. Yeah. I was a rookie cop and he was chewing me out for shooting a guy in a car that I shouldn't have done. And uh, set the whole city of New York on fire and and uh, and and I got chewed out by Sinatra, and, uh, and he said uh, something like, I got my eye on you, Harmon. One more thing, and you're gone. And, uh, but 
there's a cute little story about that. Uh, my agent called me and said they want to see you for this movie, The Detective, Frank Sinatra, who play a rookie cop, and they want to, the uh, director wants to interview you, Gordon Douglas, Sherry Netherland Hotel, New York, and East Side. You go there and at this time, and I did, and I went up, and the guy in the hallway said, are you Tom Atkins? I said, yeah. Uh, Mr. Douglas is right in here, and uh, you can go in here and talk with him. So I went into the room, and Douglas was there, and he said, so what do you think of the part? And I said, I'd seen the sides, and I said, I like it, you know, it's great. And uh, it's really with uh, Mr. Sinatra, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, uh, sounds, sounds great to me. Do you think you could uh, do that? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. You ready to read? And I said, yeah. And I thought, I'm going to read with him. Douglas, the director, and he goes and knocks on the door, and Sinatra comes into the room from, a, from another room. Well, that, that, uh, that put a genuine nervousness into it, which the part required, you know? Because I knew I was being chewed out by the chief detective of the whole force, and my my career in life was in his hands, and so was my kind of professional career in life in, in a weird way. But um, we read together, and it went real well. And I can tell by the end, you know, he said, "Thanks a lot, kiddo. You did real good. That was great." And he he walked back into the room he had come out of, and Douglas said, "Well, you had the part." I, so, uh, I only have one question. I said, what? He said, could you be that nervous when we actually shoot the scene? I said, my God, yeah, it's Frank Sinatra for Christ's sake. Sure I can. Yeah. So that was 1967, 50 years later. I'm still, still, I'm still making believe and pretending. Fighting along with... Zena Warrior Princess and the rest of them. Yeah, that was tough. what a wonderful job that was. They they flew and it came up in, out of the middle of nowhere and they flew my son who was six at the time and my wife Janice and me to New Zealand. Put us up in a beautiful apartment in Auckland and we were there for two weeks and Lucy Lawless, who played Zena, I played her father, but not really her father. I was a morphed imagination of the, her evil nemesis, the good-looking, dark-haired guy who died, unfortunately. But um, she heard her back in the middle of the shoot. At least that's what she said. And the AD came to me, or somebody came to me, the director or assistant director said, Lucy heard her back, we're going to shut down for four days. And uh, not to worry, though, everybody will go and work on Sorbo's thing, Hercules, on the next set. And uh, so the crew, everybody's taking you and your wife and son can see the rest of New Zealand for four days. And I often wondered, did she do that for every actor that comes from the States, to, you know, conveniently hurt her back or give you a little mini vacation in the middle of it. But we did get to go to Christchurch in the South Island, Queenstown, Queensland, whatever it's called, and uh, down to Tasman Sea. It was on oh, doubtful sound. It was great, great, wonderful job. What, yeah. What was it 50, maybe even more years ago as you're developing your skills as an actor that got you to want to be an actor? You know, it's it's all, honestly, God, my brother and Dickie and I, when we were little, and, and that's a long, long time ago, we would go to the Harris Theater up in Mount Oliver and watch the Durango Kid uh, kill everybody and, and that he needed to and, and do away with the bad guys. And him and his buddy Smiley 
Barnett or something who rode a horse called Ring Eye, had a big ring black ring painted around his eye. Well, we'd come out of that theater after seeing um, the deserts of El Dorado or something and ride down the street doing it, you know, making the sound and shooting everybody that come out of the... I didn't... I just made believe my whole life. I didn't... I don't know that I... I think you're born to be an actor or you're not. You're either a good actor always or you're not. I, I really... I genuinely believe that. And how I got into it, I was dating a girl at Duquesne University after I got out of the Navy, I was in Duquesne, and uh, I was dating this girl, and she belonged to the Red Masters, who were an extracurricular theater group. And I said, well, I'm not getting my fair share of your time. You're always over here rehearsing or doing stuff with the theater. And she said, uh, come on over, and uh, you can join in, be, do something, and we'll see more of each other. So they were doing a William Saroyan play, The Time of Your Life. I had about 50 people in it. I played Rocky the Day Bartender or something. Something part like that. And I really liked it. It was a lot of fun. So I did more and more. I did Streetcar Named Desire. I played you know, Stanley Kowalski in that and some other Russian Gorky play. And, and I thought, oh, I think I want to go to New York, see if I can do this. I did, and I did, and I do. And I, <laughs> that's it. That's basically, that was it. I think I was, I was too naive to think that it wouldn't work out. I just figured it will work out, and it did. And I, I got lucky. So, see if they have any questions. That's what I was about to do. Yeah. Does anyone have questions for Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I understand you just finished shooting on a uh, science fiction movie recently, uh, Encounter. Yeah. Yeah, could you tell us a bit about that? Were you on that? Did you work on that? No. Oh, how did you hear about it? You told me yesterday. Oh, okay. Wow. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I just made uh, a, a movie down in Augusta, Georgia called Encounter, and it's a sci-fi film, and it's a really wonderful, wonderful story and we hope it turns out good we finished shooting the middle of may and started the beginning of april finished the middle of may and they're still putting it all together it's still you know music and sound and stuff and uh what what made it different is the alien and there is an alien in it is not a Alien in the sense that the movie chain aliens is. It, it is, it's not CGI created, it's practical, you can touch it, it can touch you, and it's weird, but I hope, I hope it works. I don't know. We'll see. But I get the, I don't get the girl. I didn't, I'm way too old for that. I don't kill anybody. I don't shoot anybody. I don't arrest anybody. I play a biology professor. And I do die in the film, but of natural causes. Not at the hands of any foreign creature or eerie thing. Yeah. I think it's going to be good. Luke Hemsworth is one of the stars in it, one of the Hemsworth boys. And uh, Anna Hutchison from Cabin in the Woods is the, oh, one of the lead girls. Cheryl something. Uh, Chris Showerman, the guy who played Tarzan too. The guys are all beef, except for me. I'm just old and, uh, and uh, fading. But I... Uh, I solved the mystery of the alien, and it's a, uh, it's really nice, nice film. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, a lot of actors have a role that they regret turning down that they were offered. 
or they have this dream role that they auditioned for that they didn't get. Mm -hmm. Do you have one role that stands out in your long career that you wish you had played, but for whatever reason you didn't get? No, not really. You know, I do, but the story's not worth it, and it's a... Uh, uh, any, uh, any role that... Um, I never went up for anything, any film that, that that if I didn't get it, it didn't turn out that good anyway. So it, it's not like I um, was up for something and didn't get it. It was a personal thing, and it didn't doesn't matter. No, not really. Anybody else? Uh, one of my favorite scenes of your songs is in Night of the Creeps when, uh, <clears throat> when, you, uh, uh, when you're confessing to what you did to the psycho, we did the psycho killer for her and his girlfriend. What did you, like, how was that scene for you? Like, I love you that scene. Yeah, it's one of my I favorite. love that scene. When, uh, when I read that scene, I thought, oh, Freddie, you have written a real, this is a, this is a golden scene. And I asked him, how are you going to shoot that? And he said, I'm going to start um, and just get tighter and tighter and tighter and yes. tighter. Almost imperceptibly tighter on you. So that by the end of it, this is kind of all we're seeing is, is that. So I could be real still and real intense and real. I love that scene. Yeah, it was good. It was great. I I love the way he wrote it and I love the way he shot it and I love the way he allowed me to play. It. Awesome. Yeah. With Spanky. <laughs> was it Spanky? Yeah. That I did Spanky. that yeah, scene. Spanky, yeah. yeah. That I was telling the story to. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I guess I love The Father. It's like one of my favorite movies, and I watch it quite often, especially like when I'm doing work and stuff, because it's just another movie, and I can even say the lines from it. But mm -hmm. what I thought was really interesting was when you did, like, your character, even though he does get to give the Curtis, which not only happens to everybody, but mm -hmm. again, you're kind of like this guy who took care of the town. You weren't the mayor, you weren't the police chief, but you were the guy that took care of the town, and when things go wrong, you were the one that everybody seemed to turn to. Like, yeah. you know, like the good guy that yeah. everybody knew. And again, yeah. one of my favorite scenes, and it was just like, how did they decide to do that one scene where they're, you're on the boat and you and Jamie Lee are just talking? Yeah. And that was one of my favorite scenes with you because you're telling like your story about, I don't believe in, in super, supernatural, but I believe in luck. And you yeah. know, kind of just have this discussion where you're talking about your dad's speech. Yeah. And he's like, I found, and almost like doing the whole, you know, that this, this event has been happening forever. Yeah. For the last hundred years, but it's just not always been out in the periphery, and yeah. now it's coming to town. I had this nice just discussion, and everything was set up. And how did they come? Because what did they? How did they figure to slow down the action there? Like, did they I, talk to them? I'm not sure. John, you know, John, um, John did that. He wanted to do it on the boat. And he hated. Oh my God, he hated all, all that water shooting. He, it wasn't all that much. It was only. Me and her going out looking for the boat, and finding the boat, and then being on the boat a little bit, and that was the end of the boat. But uh, yeah, he hated that, and um, I'm not sure why he wanted it slowed down. I think it was a good spot for just letting a, a good story be told without a lot of crap in the way or. Around it, and did the guy fall out of the? He, yeah, they had the lock cabinet, open, and she first fell. or no? He had at, the, at the end of the story, yeah, huh? Yeah, to see it, yes. Well, because whatever was the locker, it scares Jamie Lee Curtis, and she stands up, and yeah. then the net moves, and the body falls on her. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, which <laughs> yeah. But that was after the story, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I know um, it's my own father had died uh, in 
know, about 10 years before that, and it was a big loss to me, and he never got to see me do anything, and he died in 67 before uh, the detective or any of that stuff. So it was uh, it was easy to 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 tell the story and, um, and make uh, the same um, kind of emotions or feelings that I had for my father for the uh, old guy we were talking about in the story. Yeah, I just really love that scene because again, you have a lot of stuff happening, but yeah. it's almost like this. You know, just kind of Very like, sweet and yeah. human scene. And then yeah. the body falls out. Bang. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll tell I'll tell you a story about Johnny Cazale, one of the all time great actors who died way too young. He was Fredo in The Godfather One and Two and they killed him out in the middle of the lake. Poor Johnny. And but he and I knew each other and worked together at the Long War Theater and were good friends and um Actually, we were in a play together about to open in, well, in rehearsal for a play at the Long Wharf when he got uh, the first one he got, either Deer Hunter or Godfather, I can't remember. He left to do that. But he, um, 1971, we took a, um, this is about, I'll connect it to the story in in a, in a roundabout way, but we took uh, two plays from the Long War Theater to the Edinburgh Festival in Edinburgh, Scotland. And you'd go for two weeks and you'd, you'd alternate um, the plays, not a week or a week, but through the two weeks you'd do them in what they call rep. You might do one in the afternoon, one in the evening, and of uh, the two different plays. So he and I were only in the one play. We had a little more time off, and back then, I don't know if it's still that way, it's still going on, the festival, but they would make every effort they could that if you weren't working, you could get tickets to whatever was going on that you could see as a performance in that. So we went to the Mahler Second Symphony, directed by Leonard Bernstein, the New York Philharmonic, with a combined choir of Scotland. It was a huge, huge symphony. It is anyway. But at the end, after the fifth movement, which just goes through the roof, and it's so emotional and so big. Oh, man. It just, we come down the steps onto the sidewalk, him and his girlfriend, me and my girlfriend, the, the artistic director of the theater, and his wife. And we walk on the sidewalk, and I look at Johnny, and he is bawling like a baby. I'm heaving, sobbing, and so am I. And I said, what are you crying about? And he said, my father died four years ago. I can't think of anything except my father. It's just the whole symphony just... And he said, what about you? And I said, me too. My dad died three years ago, and I just, I, I just could not think of anything but him the whole time. And times that we didn't have together, times that we did have together. And I'm telling you, we, we cried halfway down the block to, uh, to a bar to get a drink, but we were forever bonded after that. And... Uh, I think all of theater and movies and everything, as much as you can, it's about fathers and sons and, uh, you know, genuine, real emotions that you uh, feel. And if you can put them into a scene, you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question? I was just curious, um, your character in uh, Night of the Creek, did you face the, did you face someone, any, anyone? It seemed very uh, Peter Dunn to me. No, uh, uh, Freddie Decker's, you know, he, Decker loved Raymond Chandler kind of movies, and 
Is it my character name? What the hell is my character name? Raymond. Raymond something. Anyway, yeah. he 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 was like a, a conglomeration of uh, every old um, Raymond Chandler jaded, worn out, world weary yeah. detective cop who had been doing it for three years too many and should have just quit or left the force or yeah. taken his uh, papers and uh, but no no not based on anybody real or anything in my performance I just uh, I said the words basically because I, I thought he wrote a great script and it was a lot of throw me and got good news and bad news. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. <laughs> <laughs> the zombies come up the lawn looking for their prom dates. It just, it was so much fun to do. It was good very, stuff. Very good part of oil. <laughs> yeah. I do cops good. And I, I, I came out of a, I came out of a, um, oh, what the hell you call it? My big fat gyro place in, uh, near where I live and there's these three guys in sweatshirts in the in the parking lot and I'm, I'm walking to the car with my bag of stuff to take home and uh, up over the hill to home and this guy come over and said excuse me were you ever a cop and I said no no I was never a cop but I played a lot of cops he said well, I know you played a lot of cops I know you're a good actor you play cops real good I was wondering if you were ever a cop before you became an actor. I said, no, no. He said, because you do them real good. <laughs> and they were all, they were all uh, retired uh, city, uh, Pittsburgh City Police detective. <laughs> retired, yeah. I thought that was a wonderful compliment. I, I really like that. Yeah. Anybody else got one last question for Tom? I got a question. Uh, you work with James Gardner. I love James Gardner. <laughs> I loved him. I've heard he was re he's strange unless you really get to know him. Uh, but I'm not sure. Could you talk about your experience with him at all? Oh yeah, I didn't find him strange at all. Where'd you ever hear he was strange? I I watched his interview with Dick Cavett, and it seemed like he's hard to get close to, like uh -huh. in a party or something. Like he doesn't like to be around people. Well, you know, when you stop and think about it, it was with Dick Cabot. He is no, uh, <laughs> he is one odd fellow himself. <laughs> okay. And uh, I thought Jimmy Garner was just great. I loved working with him. We uh, did, I think, six Rockford Files and then three Rockford File movies in the 90s that we did later. Uh, oh, that's one of the regrets. There are, um, one of those movies we did in the 90s after I had been bumped up, I was always Lieutenant Alex Deal, trying to pull his ticket, throw him in the slammer, and Beth, Beth always came down and rescued him and got him out. And Dennis was always on his side helping him out. But on the first movie that we did, it was uh, really good. And, me and uh, James Luisi were both in it. We had never been in the series together. We were the same kind of recurring guy, but we were in it together. But man, I had some really good scenes with Jim. And uh, I, I remember at, at the end of one, oh, my kid was on the set too, and my wife, they came out for a visit. So. Uh, my kid got to stand over by the sound box and go, uh, Charlie Eight, Charlie Apple, scene 23, take two. <laughs> and, and I heard his little voice and I thought, oh, the damn. And Jim said, is that your boy? I said, yeah. He said, but no. And so we got through that, but, we, but it, was a, it was pretty solid. It was good stuff. We were doing good work. And... Uh, the writer, Juanita Bartlett, said, I think this could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And I said, yeah, no, that, was, uh, that was fun. 
So she wrote the next one. Man, it was really great. It was all me and him and um, a couple other people, but really wonderful shit. And I had to do a play. Oh. I had to do uh, Steward of Christendom, which I had already committed to. And uh, we were in rehearsal, and when they called me from the Rockford, you know, we want to start. Uh, I said, I can't. I just can't. I can't leave the play. I can't do it. Hmm. So uh, that uh, the guy that played a coach uh, in a bar or something did it. I can't remember. Castaneda? Castellanto? Huh? Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Castellanto or something like that? No, I, I don't know. Maybe. I, it is a Casa something. Okay. Yeah. Folks, we are out of time, but let's hear it one more time for Mr. Tom Atkins. Oh, thanks. being the fans you are. <laughs>